Hello, my name is Mage and welcome to Black and White Thinking. In today's video, I am going to be talking about one of my favourite stories, Critical Role's Campaign 1, also known as Vox Machina, and specifically how I think it provides us with an interesting and hopefully valuable metaphor for a particular bisexual talking point. So let's roll initiative and get into it. If you like this video or anything on my channel, please consider doing all the usual irritating YouTube things, liking, subscribing, sharing, checking out my other work and links below. All citations for this video will be on screen or in the description. Vox Machina! Two shots. Fuck shit up! <laughs> Two shots, ready. <laughs> Before I get into the main meat of this video and attempt to clumsily make my point, I want to provide some context for what I'm going to talk about because I think it is important to lay the scene for this particular video. And whilst it may be safe to assume that most people who click on a video about Critical Role probably know what it is, I'm sure some people will be watching this video simply because it's about bisexuality. And so I need to lay the landscape. Even for those of you who do know what Critical Role is, there are still a few clarifications I think I need to make that are important. Critical Role is a live stream playthrough of Dungeons and Dragons hosted by voice actor Matt Mercer, the Dungeon Master, and a bunch of his voice actor friends. Laura Bailey, Marisha Ray, Ashley Johnson, Liam O'Brien, Talison Jaffe, Travis Willingham, and Sam Regal. The cast expands over the years and there are guests, but those are the names that may come up in our discussion today, so those are who you need to know. A game they played in private that eventually moved in front of the cameras, spinning off into animated adaptations, comics, game sets, and enthralling millions of fans across the world. At the time of writing this video, Critical Role is on its third campaign, but we shall be focusing on its first, known as Vox Machina named for the party they are playing as. A misfit, found family who seek revenge on each other's enemies, slay dragons, and are almost all incredibly fucking bisexual. I enjoy all of Critical Role, but my heart is kind of owned by the first campaign because of its great character work, the slapdash way it all kind of came together in the early days, and again, the raging bisexuality brought to the table by all of these nerds. In order to talk about the writing of Vox Machina, it's important for me to note that I cannot really talk about the writing of Vox Machina. Vox Machina is not a scripted show, none of the playthroughs are, they're not novels or anything like it. It's a D&D game and therefore it does not come together in the typical way any other piece of written media might. And really this video is not about the writing of Vox Machina anyway. I am going to instead be using Vox Machina and the story it tells to examine metaphor more specifically. There is no blame in this story that can really be found. Well, maybe minorly, but we'll get there. And blame sounds dramatic, that's not what I'm here to do. But for example, I am currently 30,000 words into the third draft of a rant about how George Martin and his Game of Thrones cronies are bad writers objectively, and that's easy because they are writers. Matt Mercer is not a writer and neither are his players, at least not in this context, at least not in a traditional manner. The story told through Vox Machina and Critical Role overall is a collective coming together, sometimes without any of them having a choice in decision making or how said things do actually come together. Matt is a guide, the players are almost always improvising, and sometimes the dice just say whatever they want to say. This is distinctly different from other types of linear storytelling, so please just bear that in mind as I discuss things from a metaphorical angle. Things just play out in the moment. Planning is very limited in this setting, and so again, pinning a specific writing choice or story arc onto one person in this type of roleplay setting is entirely impossible, and just absolutely not the point I want to make with this video. I also want to say, which I feel like I shouldn't, but I'm going to, this is not a shipping video. If I was going to make a shipping video about Critical Role, it would be about how Vex and Percy are one of the greatest couples in any media, like, ever, and I want both of them to be my partners and my parents, even if that's a bit weird. Specifically today, I'm going to be talking about the romances had by Liam O'Brien's character, Faxaldan, with playable character Keyleth, played by Marisha Ray, and non-playable character Sean Gilmore, played by Dungeon Master Matt Mercer. Matt and Marisha are also married in real life, which is kind of irrelevant, but you know, also relevant in the fact that damn these nerds will be really meta in their bisexuality while playing this game, and I personally love it. Like, I love Critical Role so much, but that's a whole video in itself. The focus of today's metaphor, as I said, is Liam O'Brien's Vaxeldan, a half-elf rogue assassin who travels with his twin sister, Vex, and Vox Machina throughout the first campaign. Vax is emotive, empathetic, and very, very bi. He cares deeply for his friends and is incredibly protective of his sister, whilst also being a suave, sarcastic, and irresistibly charming arsehole. 
In the early episodes of Critical Role, O'Brien, as Vax, has two romances playing out for him. He backs himself into a hole a little because Liam loves to flirt in character. As I mentioned, one relationship is with Ray's playable character, Keyleth, a kind-hearted and socially anxious druid who is just doing her best. Keyleth and Vax's relationship is an awkward freshman romance. Described by the team at one point as practically asexual, they are both bumbling but cute nonetheless. Their mismatched fumbling around each other is so uncomfortable sometimes, it's almost always endearing. The other relationship that Vax has is with Mercer's NPC, Gilmore, an eccentric, fabulous and incredibly gay shop owner who takes a liking to the group and sponsors them on their missions. Vax and Gilmore's relationship is practically the antithesis of Vax's relationship with Keyleth. It is deeply flirtatious and full of innuendo, a relationship built on enjoying each other's company in the moment and one where physical intimacy is more integral to its foundations than that of Vax and Keyleth. Neither relationship is better or worse for this, it is just simply a fact of the playthrough. The relationships are really not very comparable outside of the fact that they both happen to Vax at similar times. As the game progresses, Liam as Vax makes a choice, feeling clearly like a bit of an art for stringing two people along, at least in his eyes, and decides to break off his relationship with Gilmore in order to pursue Keyleth more seriously. I've come close many times to going further than I have. You were a charming man, Gilmore. But I respect you very much. And I need to tell you that I can't do the dance anymore. I am in love with someone I don't think loves me, but all the same, it wouldn't be fair to you to think that we might dally. And I don't want to be a liar, so I won't be. Liam's reasons for doing this are his own, and again, I don't really want to analyse the inner thoughts of the players too much with this video, but I do think this situation plays out in a way that sets off my bisexual senses, and does provide a situation worth analysing in relation to the bisexual experience. I want to talk more specifically about the decisions Vax makes as a character, unless the decisions Liam makes whilst playing that character, but obviously that won't always be possible, and although this is definitely not a critique or overt analysis of Critical Role, god how I wish I could write that for money, there will be moments where it is hard to separate the decisions that Liam makes from that of his character, and honestly some of the reactions to the relationships made by other players at the table. As I just said, Vax, early on, finds himself at a crossroads that I think exists for a lot of bisexuals. One that I know personally lots of people have experienced. What I call the bisexual choice paradox. Paradox maybe isn't even the best word, because honestly I feel like it is more of a fallacy. Vax is bisexual, and therefore he is attracted to Gilmore and Keyleth in ways that are similar, but are inherently different. And whilst I think that there is definitely an argument to be made that Vax's choice to pursue Keyleth over Sean was one made out of convenience, you know, Gilmore is an NPC who does not travel with the group and Keyleth is a playable character that does, I do think this situation can be dissected a little further. In these two relationships, we see two parts of Vax coming to fruition. We see the part of him that seeks comfort and stability with Keyleth, and with Gilmore, we see the part of him that craves adventure and unadulterated fun. And whilst both relationships are bisexual because Vax is bisexual, to the outside eye his relationship with Keyleth can be seen as a straight one, and his relationship with Gilmore a gay one. This instantly puts the two relationships at an unequal level, even in the greater world of Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe not for Vax or other bisexuals who find themselves in what I will call a monosexual love triangle for the sake of clarity, but to the rest of the world, and those that judge the relationships of bisexuals, even when they do not necessarily mean to consciously. Like Vax isn't even the only bisexual member of Vox Machina, but he is the one that finds himself stuck between a rock and a hard place in this regard, or a straight and a gay place maybe makes more sense. There is something about this choice that Vax makes to pursue one relationship over the other, one that is not necessarily built out of preference, but rather convenience, that I always found a little heartbreaking. 
And again, I promise it's not a shippy thing on my behalf. I'm not really invested heavily in either of these relationships. Vax's best relationship is the one he has with his sister, in my opinion. But the way the lines are drawn, the way the two relationships are portrayed, leans into some very common experiences I think bi people have more often than we talk about necessarily. I have discussed this previously on this channel, but there is always this constant expectation that bisexual people must choose to either live a gay life or a straight one, based on who they are dating at any given point. And those relationships, as I said before, are made unequal, simply because we live in such a biphobic and homophobic society. Vax's relationship with Sean is often portrayed and seen as a frivolous one, more sexual and less serious where his relationship with Keyleth is often interpreted as less sleazy and therefore more serious. Again, I really, really, really don't want to discuss the playable aspects of this game too much and how these things come up in the game because of the chaotic nature of playing D&D. But even at the table, these things are clear. There is a lot of, ah, oh, how sweet when Vax and Keyleth interact and lots of, ooh, how naughty when Gilmore and Vax do. When Vax asks Gilmore out on a date at one point, one player in particular constantly calls it a man date and is very gleeful in that awkward, wow, gay stuff is happening and I do not know how to react kind of way. I'm not going to talk about which person that was because again, I don't really want any part of this video to feel like I am criticising how a bunch of friends play Dungeons and Dragons together. I would also go to bat to argue that this particular person isn't homophobic, so I'm just not going to throw them under the bus like that. If you know, you know, and we can all keep that to ourselves. But really, there are a few points about bisexuality that I want to discuss using Vax's decision as a jumping off point. Because, well, this decision that Vax makes to pick one relationship over the other is not one he makes because he doesn't like Gilmore. But more, really, if we're being honest, one he makes because he feels like he has to. Because being bisexual, at least for those trying to be accepted by greater society, being bisexual is not simple. Bisexuals are often made to choose a path in life that isn't really actually a choice. Hence, the bisexual choice fallacy. Bisexuals, in order to just get on with their lives, have to pick whether they fit more into a straight life or a gay one. Monogamy, and more specifically the strain of monosexuality, doesn't always allow bisexual people the chance to explore themselves and what they want, who and what they are attracted to. And that is not to assume that all bisexuals are non-monogamous, but monosexual culture does not really allow for bisexuals to explore this fact. And even bisexuals who are monogamous and comfortable in that are still very much expected to erase part of their identity more times than not in these relationships. If a bisexual is dating a straight person, they will be pigeonholed as straight. If they date someone gay, they will be seen as gay. If you date the opposite sex, you're straight. If you date the same sex, or even someone non-binary, you will be seen as gay. And non-monogamy is never considered. Not for most bi people, and not for vax. Like, why isn't he even allowed to explore that? More importantly, why does he feel like he is being shady if he does like more than one person? And Vax seems to act as if he was the problem for liking two different people in two different ways, as if it is somehow seedy. He even apologises to Gilmore for this, for essentially stringing him along. And yeah, maybe he was, but maybe also monosexuality is a prison for bisexuals, and choosing a life of supposed normalcy is sometimes easier than having to face that. And as for statistics on bisexual people, and dating generally goes, most bisexual people, like Vax, will date people of the opposite sex more often than that of the same sex. And I think the why is not discussed enough, so we're going to do that. Why do bisexual people generally date the opposite sex over the same sex? Is it a preference? Spoiler, it's not. And is it really a choice, or just an unfortunate reality of being bisexual in a monosexual society? I definitely have a few ideas myself, I mean, I, I made a list, but after research, there do seem to be a few more definitive answers. Firstly, although I don't think it is a defining factor, and in regards to Vax, I don't even think it's very relevant, I do think the need for biological reproduction is still a big one for a lot of people, regardless of sexuality, and obviously for people that consider that a priority, they need to open themselves up to mixed sex relationships. And that aligns with this assumption of heteronormativity. Heterosexuality is still considered all over the world as the normal, average, and therefore right option. Anything else is, well, queer, and therefore life is harder for people who are in same-sex relationships for a lot of reasons. Getting married can be harder, having children can be harder, being accepted by family members can be harder, medical care can be harder, getting a job can be harder. 
These are all easily provable facts, and beyond that, bisexuals find all of these things generally harder than their homosexual counterparts. I have covered that a lot in like almost every other video on this channel. There is a serious pressure on bisexuals to be quote normal that just does not exist for heterosexual people. And although it exists for homosexual people, bisexuals are constantly at threat from the double closet. Bisexuals are rejected from heteronormative places, but they are also rejected from so-called LGBT spaces. Bisexuality is rejected by all sides, and this fear of rejection has been statistically proven to further closet bisexual people in a way that it does not closet homosexual people. There is active hostility towards bisexual people from lesbian and gay people, and there is a disturbingly high number of lesbian and gay people who still refuse to date anyone that is bisexual. And of course that is not limited to lesbian and gays. Bisexuals suffer from intense homophobia, especially in the dating pool, from straight people as well. Straight men want hot bi girlfriends to objectify but not respect, to accuse of cheating at every turn. And straight women also have a terrible habit of seeing every bisexual man as gay in waiting, some even repulsed by the concept of dating a man that has dated other men. This is only further reinforced by the numbers game. There are more openly straight people in society than openly LGB people, and therefore the dating pool for bisexuals is almost exclusively made up of straight people, who do not usually encourage a well-rounded bisexual identity in their partners, and not even through intentional maliciousness at all times. The idea of being bisexual has just been so erased from the public consciousness that most people just do not know how to treat bisexual people. They don't know how to affirm them in their sexuality even when they love them. This leads to bi people being in the closet even with their partners, which is miserable to think about, and a uniquely bisexual experience. Most bisexuals do not report a preference, and yet huge numbers of bisexuals pretend to be straight. This cannot be laid at the door of bisexual duplicity, but more reasonably at the door of biphobia, intentional or otherwise. According to a 2020 study from the New Mexico State University, predictors of bisexual individuals' dating decisions regarding heterosexual norms the data suggests that heteronormativity may be a factor in predicting dating decisions. An individual's outness in terms of their sexuality was a significant predictor of a bisexual's decision in dating the opposite sex. Being out in one's sexuality may be a large indicator of whether a bisexual individual is likely to date the opposite or same sex. Individuals who are not out or are partially out may feel a need to conceal their true sexual orientation, potentially limiting themselves to dating the opposite sex in order to conceal their sexuality. There is, unfortunately, and the gods know I have discussed this a million times already, no such thing as the bisexual community. Bisexuals are so insecure they don't know how to vouch for themselves or their needs. They don't know how to stand up and be counted, how to take up the space that they should. A good proportion of straight people and even gay people think that bisexuality is just not real. That it is a phase because bisexuals have learned to fit themselves into the only boxes that oppressors have offered them in order to survive. They are alienated from both straight and gay people, and when the options are either alienation or simply just pretending, most people will pick pretending, because they believe it will bring less stress into their lives. There is no proof that it is less stressful, and bisexual people actually suffer higher levels of mental health issues than their gay and straight peers, quite often and very easily correlated to the double closet, but it is easy to understand people's thinking here. Bisexual people need access to bisexual resources, explicit ones, because without them they don't know who they are. And in relation to Vox Machina, it is evident that even in a space where bisexuality is accepted and other bi people literally exist, without an open conversation about what that actually means, without a discussion about bisexuality and what it is, what it looks like, then it means nothing. Bisexuals have to be open, and they have to be given the opportunity to be open, otherwise the call of heteronormativity is always going to drag us back down. Community isn't simply the existence of bisexual people in one place. It isn't passive. It is an active attempt to lift each other up and understand each other in all facets of the bisexual experience and identity. And the bisexuality of Vox Machina, the bisexuality of Vax, who I love deeply regardless, is passive. My name is Mage, and this was Black and White Thinking.